The Sacred and Terrible Air by Robert Kurvitz Chapter 4 Vidkun Hirt Twelve millimeter film buzzes in the projector. On the couch next to the white fabric screen, Hans sits next to Maciek, staring in disbelief at his square coffee cup on a square saucer. He picks up the spoon to stir in the sugar and carefully approaches the cup. In Café Kino, everything is made of glass or white. The chair where Jasper sits and fiddles with the projector is white. The soundproof walls of the booth are made of glass. The sign on which the white fabric screen falls is made of glass. The sofa where Han and Maciek feel uncomfortable is white. There is a stuffed albino tiger in a glass case in the middle of the cafe. Just make sure you don't break anything. It will cost you dearly. Let me guess. The agent twists the Astra between his fingers until it's as soft as he likes. Your design? Uh, one of my students. This place is like a movie screen, a white sheet. We have been projected here. You know, um, what is it like to be? It's not at all cinema screen. You understand? Yeah, I do. It's uncomfortable. Uh, the boy is a bit jittery, sure, but he's talented. He needed this sort of high visibility project and then uh, this is the only place where you can quickly get behind the projector. So I try, you know, to be open-minded. Jasper, together with the tiger, looks towards Han. The tiger's glass eyes are an even brighter blue than the interior designers. Hey man, I'm open-minded. Mashaik takes a pencil and a notebook from his jacket pocket. Well then, begins Jasper, a relative of one of my co-workers works as an operator. Makes stocks. Last fall, he told me about his new project. With Gessle. Uh, do you know Konrad Gessle? Uh, mainly does criminal stuff, doesn't he? Not exclusively. Gösta, uh, that's the name of my operator, tells me how he's afraid to do it and asks me if, if he really should. He has a child at home too now and so on. The point is that the film is about... Uh, this is where it gets interesting. Vidkun Hird. Oh my god. Enough about Vidkun Hird. Wait, wait. I, I agree, it's a well-worn topic. He was in Arda then, he couldn't possibly be in Barca, and so on. But I still thought I'd keep an eye on it, you know? And then, two weeks ago, Gosta comes to talk to me. Tells me they're on the verge of a breakthrough here. Um, they've been sitting down with Wittgen Hirt in Kronstadt for the past six months. Unbelievable. And they allegedly have a strategy there. They impress him. Wittgen likes Gessle. Gessle is Nordic, white as snow, well read, and a good debater. So, Heard wants to impress the viewer and interviewer, and he starts chatting, bragging. Gessle gives the impression that these rapists with a wild imagination have been seen before, but Wittgen is just a smaller player. Yeah. Yeah. So for three months, <coughs> Vidkun just hints, arouses interest, references unverifiable dates, talk about going to the beach. Gessley doesn't even notice. He discusses philosophy with Vidkun about overcoming good and evil. Um, I've written it all down here. Jasper pats the folder on the cape, uh, cube-shaped glass table. Then one day, Wittgen has had enough. The man flicks the switch, and the small bulb at the heart of the projector lights up. I have to warn you now. He looks in Han's direction, and 
those of us whose profession does not include ditches and missing children take some of Vitkin's words to heart. Tirish piles a sixth spoonful of sugar into his black coffee and pauses for a moment. After a noticeable beat of silence, he sticks his needle-sharp HB pencil into the pencil sharpener and pretends to be busy with it, and an awkward smile on his face. Dude, when you will understand, huh? Ditches and missing children? That's your topic too. Okay, Jasper. Uh, ditches and lost children. Okay, Han. Sighs Jasper. It is my topic. To ditches and lost children. Therese cheerfully raises his sugar filled coffee cup in the air and waits. Skull! exclaims Han. Skull. Jasper states and fishes the lime slice out of his glass of water. He chews on it his brow thoughtfully furrowed at the sour taste. The tape, Jasper? Um, the projector clicks. Superhuman, rapist, child rapist, former member of Hjemdal, the fascist party of NFD, Vidkun Hird, appears on the white screen. With one hand cuffed to the chair and the other resting gently on his cheek, it's clear the philosopher of the future is aware of the presence of the camera. Mindful of it, he raises his northern bulldog-checked chin to a certain noble angle. There he casts glances up and down from the recesses of his eye sockets. Hair carefully combed to the side according to the third-year-old fashion and one leg resting across the other knee. Bitcoin could be said to be a vain man. Refusing to go down in history in his color-coded prison overalls, he converses with Conrad Gessley in his black shirt uniform. That had been just one of his many conditions. Some people are born posthumously, he exclaims in the ancient Arden dialect. Archaic idiom, he injects an abundance of rural charm into modernly refined sentiment. The six-digit clock on the table shows that the third hour of the August 12th interview is in progress. Do you know, Whitkin, that I have done a master's thesis on Elder Arden? I can smuggle your literature about it. Oh, that would be very nice of you, Conrad. You know how I feel about the selection of the library here. They both chuckle to signal understanding. Arden is the natural language of our tribe, continues Vitkin in a declarative tone. This vocabulary was adapted and developed by ancient mammoth hunters who settled in the slopes of Katla millennia ago. Arden has certain significant advantages in the basic matters of love of wisdom, advantages that continental languages lack. Arden is our nature. The modern Vasen, a metropolitan bastard, Regressed to the continental, imbued with grad. This diluted language is incapable of expressing truth. All the sentences in this dysgenic compot ultimately express the same thing. International gibberish. The next hundred years will see our tribe return to its original language. This will give birth to a new era. In terms of love, wisdom. Uh, you have already talked about it quite a lot. I also read your notes on this topic. It's all very interesting. But don't you think that 
your own historical character is sabotaging the finer aspects of your teaching? What? Hird's eyes suddenly light up. The deep furrows on his cheeks widen, and his mouth snores in disdain. Conrad pretends not to notice Vidkun's temper and continues. While I see the logic in your observations, don't you think it's difficult for people to accept the scientific validity of a theory when it comes from a mouth of, um, convicted child rapist? Mating is a completely different practice for a tribe than social porn propaganda of the modern century, with its romance and whatever else it's feeling with us. You know that, Conrad. One day, when their impotent morals have led them, the continental nations, to extinction, you will realize what I'm telling you. Come on, let's look at this with the eyes of an ordinary citizen for a slight moment. An ordinary citizen lets his daughter go to school with kipped and koikos ever sh since she was a child in a racial cauldron. An ordinary citizen lets his child be raped by ruberoids there. You understand that this is how it is? when four girls are sent to such a school. Conrad does not at first notice what slipped from the philosopher's lips, then gets it, but ignores it. Um, the ordinary citizen is the one you consider to be your reader in the future. The ordinary citizen chooses whether your vision will come to be or not. You are talking about a nationality. Do you think, really, you think they won't notice that the order is a fascist nationalist? A fascist and methodical rapist with a life sentence in Konstadt for at least four murders and the book is a mixture of historical philosophy, eugenics and rape. It's about history. About history, Konrad. You're a smart man, but your fancy education shows. You still think that history is done through master's theses and such. Well, what is it done through then? The experienced interviewer does not lose his cool. Rape? Vidkun snatches a page from Gessley's notepad. A guard in dark blue uniform jumps into frame after the sudden movement and hits the tribesman on the wrist with his rubber baton. Heard yelps in pain. The paper flies into the air. Three-time Oscar Zorn Award nominee, world-famous documentarian Conrad Gessley raises his hand in the direction of the prison guard. He lowers the baton, but remains alert next to the man stroking his wrist. Pen. Vidkun looks angrily in Gessler's direction. Clenching the riding stick in his fist, the prisoner casts triumphant glances towards the god. You, if you'd be so kind, hand me my page too. The rubber baton has already risen menacingly into the air when Gessler tears a new sheet from the notepad and places it on the steel table in front of Heard. See now, crossbreeding. Vidkun's carefully combed hair has become tangled in the struggle, and a single light brown strand hangs in front of his eyes. Keeping the page from sliding with his elbow, Hird tries to put the pen on the paper. It feels sharp and dangerous in his hand. The man suddenly gets angry. Please release my other hand can do it like this. At Gessley's pleading look, the guard takes the key ring from his belt. Now, Herr directly addresses the viewer. Thousands of years ago, our ancestors came here, to the land on the edge of the world. 
they came here on dog sleds through the insurmountable air. Only the strongest willed specimens retained their sanity during this heroic transition. Weak spirited, continental specimens were left behind at the mercy of the pale. Our disciplined ancestors simply separated them from the herd, those who lost their minds. Thus, only the Harkons and Gudruns, with a purified, steadfast soul and unbreakable will, stepped onto the grey soil of Katla. In half a century, these primogens hunted all the mammals of Katla to death. They flourished. Vitkan here triumphantly stretches his freed hands and begins to draw tiny dots on the sheet of paper. This is elementary eugenic law, Conrad. Elementary. The more challenging the environment, the further the human develops from steppe mural form. Here, in the dark snowy expanse, man is not meant to live here, simply to survive. A superhuman tendency must arise. Gasly lifts his shoulders in anticipation, but he doesn't interrupt and nods in understanding. The superhuman tendency is not limited by moral anachronisms. Superhuman tendency is weighed lust. Everything is possible for him. Nothing is forbidden. Through blood in the dark of night, from one winter to another, it passes from generation to generation. You too, Conrad, have a superhuman tendency in you. Conrad nods. An unhealthy redness spreads on Wittgenherd's face. The redness is somewhere between a fever and an allergic rash. All of us, including you, are obliged to amplify this primordial being in yourself, like the jaws of a predator that grows tougher as they chew meat. The duty, the duty you have to the litter, that they too should have big jaws, the kind that can hold a lot of meat. Vitkin admires his artwork, with a proud smile that in no way wants to match his face. The camera can't yet see exactly what's happening on the page, but Gessle reclines closer to the picture. A rare creature. The middle one of them. A unique treasure. The projector buzzes. Jasper takes a wrapped copy of Wittgen's paper from the folder and places it on the coffee table. Something strange is carefully mapped on the page. An elegant constellation of dozens of dots. Han's mouth drops open in horror. ICP agent Therese Mashaik, coldly composed, makes a note in his notebook. You can't imagine, Conrad, how hard I fucked her. You can't imagine. Vitkin here manages to say before Jasper hastily turns off the projector. June. Twenty years ago. The pine forest of the cliff by the beach is dim and cool. The sun is scorching above the tops of the pines, but only a few spots of light reach down here, where the sand is woven into the maze of roots, like the golden floor of the sea. For a moment, there is complete silence under the trees. From a hundred meters away you can hear the heather crunching under the sneakers of the approaching boys, until the sea breeze rustles the pine needle ceiling again. The trunks of the trees sway slightly, 
a maze of dark orange columns, sides streaked golden from the sun. The sweet smell of tree sap floats beneath the forest. The dusty aftertaste of chamomile, a sweet and bitter bouquet in the Teresa's nostrils. A match is lit. The thick puffs of smoke rising from the astra he stole from his father sweep away all the other scents, framed cleanly in a single beam of light. Tirish is enjoying himself, his windbreaker under his head. He practices making smoke rings in the glow of light. Just a few kilometers from here, in the settlement, is his father's diplomatic villa. That house, so close to the popular summer beach, had suddenly made Tirish a popular boy three weeks ago, at the beginning of summer vacation. Just as the other's footsteps become clearly audible from behind the hill, Tarish blows a small ring through the big billowing smoke jellyfish. Oh, I did it! He exclaims, demolishing his masterpiece. What? Asks Jasper, who has reached the hill in shorts and a sailor short. What did you manage to do? Uh, the smoke ring went through the second one. You smoke now? Jasper is shocked. Want some? Astra. It's the strongest. Give me one, Therese. I'd take one. The bellowing Han reaches Jasper's side. A pair of binoculars hangs from his neck on a leather strap. There. Therese throws the package towards Han who fumbles with it. With his tongue sticking out from the effort, he secures the package without dropping it and examines it through his glasses. Cool. Is Hans' professional assessment of the box. The white stars slide along the blue sky. Cardboard. Pointless, says Jasper out of the corner of his mouth and steps ahead of Therese to explore the land on top of another hill. <laughs> that short of yours is pointless. Therese lazily lifts himself up on his elbows and offers Han a light from a matchbox. Jasper narrows his eyes and raises his hand to his face like a captain examining the forest floor in front of him. Pointless, huh? Annie didn't think so. You know, she complimented me on it on the last day. You think? Jasper turns to Han. The boy smokes like a beginner. Listen, Han, do you remember in the wardrobe? Annie said this is a beautiful shirt. She said so, Tirish. She really said that. Baron jumped me like a bug and told Danny for me that she has a beautiful dress and something about her hair too. It was very funny. You can never miss an opportunity to be polite, <coughs> Han says with a smile and coughs out some smoke. Let's go. The three boys move up towards the bank in the glimmering patches of light under the trees. Han throws away the smoke with an unsuccessful flick and begins twirling his binoculars on their strap. His backpack shakes as he accelerates down the descent. Running down the slopes, most of the boys jump over the heather bushes. Only Jasper, worrying about his white trousers, strolls with dignity, hands in his pockets, as if on an evening walk. The rumbling of the sea grows in the trees the closer they get to the usual spot of the cliff. There are signs posted on the log fence marking the danger of collapse, depicting a man falling down a precipitous slope. Across the footpath, climbing into the bushes right below the sign, Han explains to Therese, Look, they call it the North Sea, but it's actually an ocean. Theoretically, it crosses the pale and turns into your Igres Sea, up until Grad. And this makes the North Sea interstellar. The question of classification. 
Together with the trio, they try to keep the conversation as academic as possible for the third week in a row, in order to impress everyone with the character of their business when they come back in the fall. Jasper, lagging behind as he moves cautiously through the bushes, continues in the same spirit. Ah, uh, we didn't have such a word as an ocean in Katla. For us, everything is a sea. A vast aquamarine body of water spreads out in front of the boys from the high cliff edge. Clouds are breaking in the pale blue sky. The bright shining is reflected as a streak down on the water. The ocean waves lazily and majestically wash a long strip of sand there. Shouts yell. The wind disappears for a moment and the wave of heat hits the boys in the face. Insects emerge from the foliage of blooming cinnamon rose bushes. The beach under the cliff curves long towards the sea, all the way to Half Sanglair Hotel at the top of the peninsula. There are small human spots on the sand with red and white striped parasols. The boys take a seat on the patch of grass between the cinnamon rose bushes where the crumbly sandstone cliff quickly disappears from sight. Many times Therese has theorized how one could basically jump down along this soft rock slope. It would land on the sand embankments that levels of 3 meters out and from there he would slide on his heels. Jasper worries about how his clothes would hold up in such a case. Han just stands out for his cowardice. Even now, Tirish seats closer to the edge, while Jasper knocks the binoculars out of Han's hand. Spots of the sun are reflected on the curved eyelets of the unit. In the dark, cool heart of the glass, the image of people on the beach below of summer Nordics with their towels and parasols amplifies. The image sharpens in turn to be acceptable for Han. The left plus seven and the right plus four. Han bought the binoculars with his own money in Wasa from a hunter's shop. Once Jasper has also given up scanning the beach, it's Teresha's turn. With the rubber nose pads pressed into his eyes, sockets and cheeks, more and more freckled from the sun, tight from squinting, he has to say, I guess not yet, it's only 10 o'clock, they'll come. While Han and Therese compare the smoke brands, the vast and trash is too light, the grud stuff stronger still, Han nods excitedly and praises everything. Jasper aims the binoculars at the beach like a sniper scope, this time relentlessly. The crosshair lands on the white parasol, but doesn't find the red flowers it is looking for. Vertical lines move over young families, collapsing sandcastles and brown-bodied sun orbiters. Stop! at two blonde girls, but then slide on. It's not them. Must have drifted too far. Jesper focuses closer. Somewhere from 200 meters away, a familiar premonition, a distant constellation, a vastness of matter emerges in the dimness of his heart. He waves his hand to let the boys know that something is going on. Han and Therese shield their eyes from the sun with their hands and look down on the beach. Refining the focus of the Zul lenses once again, the pale pink whale sharpens into a belly in Jasper's eyes. Breathing shakes the ice packs from the girl's navel above the solar plexus where the curved line of the chest converges into a ring holding together the top of a two-piece bathing suit. White ribbons cut the skin on her shoulders 
and the prepubescent breasts under the tricot fabric rise where the girl breathes. The wheel clicks twice at the points where the viewing tubes converge, and in the expanded field of vision, on a beige beach towel, the girl turns on her stomach. Her ash blonde hair and familiar round cheeks flash under a pair of sunglasses. Lazily, any Ellen Lund raises herself on her elbows and buries her face in a girl's magazine. Above her small butt, a curiously fine constellation of birthmarks begin, running up her back to her wing bone. Cold horror seeps through the seals of the windows into the Kino Cafe, where three minds are trying to maintain the surface tension of the coping for the 20th year. Han shrugs his shoulders. Who knows about that? Who knows? I haven't read a single line of it all this time. It's not recorded anywhere. Tewish puts his pencil on the table. Such a thing is called the control fact. It is intentionally left out of a person's identification record, even from the official documentation. I have these three folders in my head, and there is not one line about it. He knows that. Look at him. Jesper's face remains clear. For him, this is all a stage that has already been passed. That's why Gosta came to me. The officials simply shrugged. Perhaps he heard somewhere at work that I knew the girls, and they were all quite confused there. Here does not explain it any further. And by the way, I don't believe that shit. He had some boys there because of some principle, but Heard prefers big, breasted, good ones. It doesn't fit the profile. Not possible time-wise, Han perks up. He was 600 kilometers away, 5 hours earlier. Yes, he was 600 kilometers away, 5 hours earlier and bought a crankshaft and a gasket for his fucking raping machine. I don't know, some kind of gasket lobe. After the construction noise of the infamous rape machine, Bitcoin Herd's neighbor finally called the police and that was the beginning of the end for him. Inayat Han, on the other hand, looks at the ICP agent with seriousness. In his eyes. Trish, you have to open the folder now. Continue research. Somehow, he must know it. And it's the only serious lead right now, besides those crappy letters. You have to. You cannot imagine how bad things are now. This is the worst time to dig out any old stuff. There is no more support from Mundi. Half of everything is in a state of war. Nobody knows if, for example, Ranieri still even exists. They'll let me go if I start this shit. No, but Trish, you could still do something about it. Huh? You do this. This is your job. Jesper, slightly irritated, is not interested in the impending world war. Just do it! <laughs> now, wait, you two. Of course I will. I had that feeling from the start, when you invited me to your class reunion thing. You really think I was... <laughs> getting caught into you being nostalgic? 
I myself have this folder open all the time. You know that this folder never closes. You just have to hope that the locals will take it easy. They hate the co-op anyway here. Very rarely, very rarely does anyone bother to check whether any interrogation papers have been signed there. Han smiles slyly. <laughs> Interrogation papers? So, you're still planning on going there to Kronstadt? Yes. Tomorrow. <laughs> it's good to know that you're still cool, Tirish. Jasper smiles too. Slightly uncomfortable with his flushed cheeks and pressing tone. Ah, oh, cool. That's fine then. Therese agrees. This is a very good thing. Twenty years. There should be no hope left after all that time. But is there hope then? Jasper intelligently tilts his head, which is still a little too big for his shoulders. Yes. Very good, Jasper. You have been very good. Bill! Can you please bring the bill here? The interior designer, who has been out of active work for the past two years, snaps his fingers at the waitress and points his index finger at the table. Nights have not come easily to him. But today, everything is different. Tonight, Jasper can treat himself to small sweets. Silly little treats. There's a night outside the window of the cube in the dark where everything is possible. It is also possible that somewhere in the hidden corners of this world, under the permafrost of Lake Vostok or in the Erg Desert where Ramut Karzai disappeared without a trace, Deep from the lungs of Grad, somewhere, they can still be found, as they were then, as little ones, and thereby also become small again. Above the clouds, at the foot of the Corpus Mundi, you only have to lift the veil of raindrops just a little, and you will touch them. How good you were for not giving up. Everyone else kept forgetting about us. The night sky was dotted with cold stars. The dark blue dome of the sky swirled above our heads. But we knew you were still looking for us. <laughs>